So I'm Whit Fosberg. I'm the president and CEO of the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. This actually marks the 15th year we've been doing media summits around the country. Six years doing saltwater marine ones in Florida. And uh, it's, you know, it's a great opportunity to get our partners, as well as the media, sponsors, you know, commission, others together to talk about some of these issues. And you know, we've changed format a little bit for this in the last couple of years to have these luncheons. And we've definitely discovered that a free lunch will really bring people in, which is great. <laughs> and so we're going to force feed a little bit of conservation among your, your sort of gear thinking over the next couple of days. I'm going to introduce Ed Tamson, and he's going to coordinate this one tomorrow. We have a panel at the same time in here on all, all fisheries management issues, uh, including things like red snapper. So uh, if you enjoy today, you'll enjoy tomorrow, so come on back then. So Ed Tamson is our Florida coordinator. And Ed, why don't you come on over and introduce your panel? Great. Thank you, Ed. We have a terrific panel for you this afternoon. Uh, a couple of structural things is I would really appreciate if everyone could hold their questions until the very end. We're on a fairly time, uh, tight time frame, and we will certainly have plenty of time at the end of the presentations for questions. I'll be asking, depending on our time today, one question of each of the panel members, and then we'll move forward and start uh, having open-ended Q&A at the end. We're due to finish out here at about 1.15, 1.20. Uh, for those of you who would like to stay, we're going to have a roundtable meeting, informal, around all the issues that we've been going through in 2016 and 17, our accomplishments, our opportunities for improvement, challenges. So we'll have a roundtable discussion which we'll document. Really appreciate for those of you who want to stay for that, you're more than welcome. And it'd be good to have you participate and have your contribution. And that'll start, give or take, right around 1.30. So without further ado, I'd like to get started with our presentation. Chris, do we have all the slides loaded on this? We do. Okay. Our first presenter, and I'm very pleased that he agreed to come and fit us into our, his busy schedule, is Noah Valenstein. Noah is our secretary, our new secretary, if I can say, our new secretary with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Noah is, has a very diverse background, including serving as the policy coordinator for energy, agriculture, and environment and the executive officer, excuse me, office of the governor from 2012 to 2015. Noah also worked uh, with the affairs in terms of the director of affairs for the Everglades Foundation and also as brief, uh, very brief stint as a lobbyist for legislative affairs in the DEP. What's wonderful about Noah is that native Floridian Loves the water here like any native Floridian. And I was really pleased when I was reading about Noah and doing some uh, initial uh, background is that the cabinet, when he was appointed out of 142 applicants, he was the one applicant that was interviewed. And he was unanimously voted in and confirmed as our new uh, secretary. So let's give Noah a big hand and let's introduce him. Please, Noah. Thank you. Any opportunity for food and fellowship, I greatly appreciate. Um, and I tell you, so as the Secretary for Department of Environmental Protection, and I think Nick would attest to this too, one of the great pleasures of working in Florida on natural resources is just the amazing resources we have here as a state. It's why people move here, it's why people bring their business here, start a business here. It's the natural resources that are the foundation for our economy. And so the Everglades is obviously at the heart of that. It's America's Everglades. It's one of our jewels here in Florida. Um, and so we talk a lot about the importance of natural resources to the economy, for protecting them um, with the team we have at the department. But one thing we also try and highlight is probably one of the best resources we have here in Florida. And we always, you know, certainly the governor is competitive about a, protecting our resources, b, making 
Florida the best state to grow a business in, educate your family, and grow a family here. Um, but one of the best resources we have is our people. And I think you see that in this room, see it on the panel. You know, it takes a lot, it's a team effort to address water quality issues and natural resource issues that have arisen over years and years. And we could not, as a department, do it alone. I'm sure Nick feels the same way for his agency. It's the partnership and team effort and sort of can, can get it done attitude that everyone in this room brings that's so important to us. And so that's, that's resulted in a lot of good news recently, and that's something we want to talk about. We have a lot of challenges before us, but I want to go through before the panel again some of the really good, good news we have and also talk about how important partnerships are. So just since 2011, we've completed 16 Everglades projects. We have 18 underway. Um, we're seeing significant progress over the last six years. And the thing that really kicked it off, in my mind, I think was a real game changer was Governor Scott's had a very pragmatic approach to Everglades restoration and protecting our natural resources. And that was, let's get it done. We want to see improvements. We want to have metrics. We want to know we're protecting the foundation of our economy. And so for Everglades, that starts with getting the water clean, making sure water entering in the park and going down to Florida Bay is of the quality we need. And so for years, it has been held up in litigation, and the governor's approach was, let's stop litigating and let's start fixing the problem. And so in 2012, with the help of many of the partners actually at this table, coming together collaboratively, we came up with um, a, a plan, the governor's restoration strategy plan, to get that water cleaned up. It's $880 million. Um, it's looking to be complete in 2024, and we're seeing progress from that already. And so right now, as you can see, the transition from 2005 to 2007, we're getting results. Water is getting cleaned up. Right now in Everglades National Park, we're meeting our limit for phosphorus and under at 10 or under 10 parts right now. And so I think that progress you saw in restoration strategies and getting the water clean has really um, flowed over to other areas of, of Everglades restoration. <coughs> like many natural resource issues, there's no silver bullet. It's hard work and it's hard work across the whole resource. And so one of the other areas is the Conference Everglades Restoration Plan. Once you have the water clean, you have to have storage. Storage is incredibly important for our estuaries to make sure you're able to manage the flow of water to them. And so in the Conference Everglades Restoration Plan, we've talked a lot about we've got to see progress in storage for estuaries. And so just since 2011, we've had significant progress. In 2014, we started doing work on the C43 basin, which is a major storage feature for the West Coast, includes hatching. Um, 55 billion gallons of storage. These are massive projects. $150 million already committed by the state. We're moving forward, starting in 2014, and looking to get that complete in 2022. And I'll mention, this progress um, is led in a large part by our partners, who help us always have a sense of urgency. They see the on-the-ground conditions, um, they really help connect the dots for us between our economy and our environment. And so one thing done here was, you know, originally the project was going to be phased between two compartments. You know, that sense of urgency has led us to the leadership of South Florida Water Mansion District to make it a one-phase project, get it done quicker, get it done um, for less money. So on the East Coast, East Coast, the C44 Reservoir and Stormwater Treatment Area, again, begun in 2011. Um, same thing, we're looking to have it finished in 2022. It's an immense amount of progress um, just now in the last six years. And so another large storage project, also with a treatment um, component, which is the stormwater treatment area to protect our estuary and help buffer um, freshwater discharges from the lake going into the St. Louis Reservoir. Now, when we have the water clean, you have some additional storage capacity for it. One of the other things, you have to make sure that you're able to send the water where you need it, and that's getting it south, getting down to Florida Bay. Um, again, I can't say it enough, stakeholder participation across the board, whether it's agricultural, industrial, nonprofit partners, our fishermen, all led to very pragmatic, pragmatic approaches, such as the Central Everglades planning project, which essentially was saying, all right, we have CERP, we've got a great plan. That sense of urgency that that partnership brought to the table again said, how do we get it done quicker? You know, we want to see results. This is an incredibly 
um, important project for the state. And so SEP really worked to streamline that, get results, get water south, moving to Florida Bay more quickly. Um, and would, again, would not have been possible without our partnership. Something you probably heard a lot if you've been in Florida recently was, hey, we're knocking out of the park, we're seeing progress, and a lot of these things, there's still more to be done. And a recognition of that was Senate Bill 10 saying, you know, we need more storage. Um, we need more storage south of the lake to provide flexibility, um, both to reduce discharges to the estuaries, but also to get water south and have flexibility to move it to the south. And so that's something we're excited to see this year. The governor signed it into law. South Florida Water Management District's done a great job, I think, with a transparent public process, already establishing an online website to help folks, again, engage, be part of the process, know where we are, communicate with um, our elected officials and, and government. And I also mentioned Herbert Hoover is something that you know, this year we've enjoyed moving from, from a situation where Florida was budgeting on basically a year-by-year -year basis for natural, major natural resource issues. And with the leadership of Governor Scott and the legislature um, a couple years ago, we moved to having recurring dedicated funding for Everglades restoration and a few other major environmental issues in Florida. And so, while we enjoy it up to $200 million a year now for these major efforts, on top of that this year, the governor was able to secure $50 million for the state to help encourage the federal government to expedite the restoration of Herbert Hoover. And it's not just a public safety issue. You know, this is at the heart of a massive ecosystem restoration project. And when you're managing water um, with a system that has not been upgraded, it limits your decisions and your operational flexibility tremendously. And we want to get to a situation where we're able to get the full value out of all the other projects I've just talked about and being able to make a decision on what's best for the environment and how we maximize um, the impacts of all other projects means that we've got to get Herbert Hoover fixed and get it done quickly. And so that was a tremendous progress this year. And so lastly, you know, I'll mention on the, the partnerships, why it's so important and, and sort of leading off for the rest of the folks at the table is our economy here in Florida is absolutely founded on our natural resources. And just looking at this slide to see all the opportunities either in an aquatic preserve or a state park to get out and enjoy our resources. I know that's why we're all involved. Um, we recognize the importance of the resources, but I think sometimes you underestimate as a partner having worked both for industries, for nonprofits, I think it's easy to forget the relevancy <coughs> of these partnerships bring. Um, and so it's the direct connection between getting out of the water and fishing, it's direct connection between you know, man manufacturing business to support that recreational industry. Um, it really shows how important it is. It draws the economic connection between our resource and why we need to do these projects and really why we need to have a sense of urgency. And so with that note, it's a great pleasure to serve I'm Governor Scott in the cabin. It's a great pleasure to be here. I tell you, um, you know, one of the things that just makes it a wonderful job every day is being able to work with stakeholders like here at the table in the room. Um, it makes a tremendous difference. We get more done, more quickly, working together. Um, I think that's something that really sets Florida apart. So thank you very much, and I look forward to being part of the panel today. Thank you. Thank you. For those of you in the back, we have four seats right here. Come on up. This is a good time. You can relax. I promise not to call on you or give you a test. So feel free to come on up at any time. Perfect. Thank you. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Stephen Davis. Tell you a little bit of background about Steve and academically, because it's wonderful to have the smartest guy in the room next to you. And yeah, that's it. Everybody looks. Uh, Stephen started his academic journey. I won't go back to kindergarten. I promise. At Georgetown College, received a bachelor's degree in biology and environmental science. He also received a master's degree in biological and environmental science and then went on to get his PhD in Miami, Florida, from Florida International University. Uh, Steve is the wetland psychologist, psychologist, sometimes you are, <laughs> and the wetland ecologist. 
And for all of us in this field, especially someone like me, where the environmental world, not the fishing world, but the environmental conservation world, there's a fairly steep learning curve, as we all know. And I'm pleased to say that with Dr. Davis, Steve, as he likes to be called, he's non-stoppable. I call Steve before I do presentations, when something just doesn't smell right, and he gives me facts. Not alternative facts, the real facts. So it's wonderful to have a practitioner in the field all the time who's accessible. And with that in mind, feel free to call Steve anytime, 24-7. He is available. But most importantly, I think you're going to really enjoy his presentation, Steve Davis. Let's give him a big hand. Thanks, Ed. Um, I, I didn't coordinate this presentation at all, but you're going to find that, that the messaging that, that I'm going to present is really echoing much of what uh, Secretary Ballenstein talked about and, and actually what was the message in yesterday's uh, uh, FWC uh, commission meeting uh, on the Florida Bay presentation. It's that we're making progress. In fact, we are able to see now on the horizon uh, solutions that will restore our coastal waters and a lot of that is attributable to moving forward with these key restoration projects like the Central Everglades plan and especially what Senate Bill 10 does in advancing the planning for storage south of Lake Okeechobee that we know is so important in moving water away from the estuaries to the north and down to the Everglades and ultimately to Florida Bay and the Florida Keys at the southern end of the peninsula. So we're all the way at the top of the greater Everglades ecosystem uh, here today and we get roughly the same amount of annual precipitation that we've always received in South Florida. It's somewhere between five and sometimes up to six feet each year, much of that coming during the wet season. And the way that water is managed to this day is that water flows down the Kissimmee Chain of Lakes, down the Kissimmee River Basin, and fills up the lake. That water has to be discharged to the east and the west. What Southern Storage does, um, really not unlike a, a rain barrel in your backyard, it's, it's a device that takes water, holds it when it's in abundance. When we have a lot of water in South Florida, we have nothing to do with it now but dump it to the east and the west. Having that storage to the south of the lake allows us to send that water in a new direction. We can fill that reservoir with the same water that's coming south through Lake Okeechobee, hold it so that when the system needs it, when we're in a drought, like we were just in a month ago, uh, we can flow that water to the south and provide for the needs of the Everglades all the way to Florida Bay. Uh, we know that water needs to be clean. We have the storage capacity uh, with Senate Bill 10. We have the filtration capacity that that Secretary Valenstein talked about with uh, the, the, the water quality features and restoration strategies. And the idea is to get that water all the way to the southernmost end of the system where it flowed historically. And it's those contributions in Everglades National Park from Shark River Slough, from Taylor Slough, that really provide for the estuary condition that Florida Bay needs. And all the while, as we're sending that water to the south, we're reducing those discharges to the Caloosahatchee, to the St. Lucie in the east and west. Well, if we just rewind a couple of years, uh, going back to 2015, we had a crisis underway in Florida Bay due to a lack of fresh water inflow. And many of you I know are familiar with this, where we had an area of roughly 80 to 100 square miles of Florida Bay that experienced some level of seagrass die-off. This was in the north central part of the bay. It was the prime fishing areas of Florida Bay. And it happened overnight. High temperatures, hyper salinity conditions, uh, more than double that of seawater. Uh, initiated this die-off. Um, fishermen saw it as just fields of floating grass out in Florida Bay, as far as the eye can see. All of that biomass of, uh, of seagrass started decomposing. Not only that, but it removed the anchoring of the mud in the bottom of Florida Bay. Florida Bay is very shallow, as many of you know. And so once you remove that anchoring of the mud in the bottom and start the decomposition process, releasing nitrogen and phosphorus out in Florida Bay, eventually, and in 2016, last year, we saw the beginnings 
of turbid water conditions in Florida Bay and ultimately the development of an algal bloom uh, resulting in some of the highest chlorophyll A concentrations that we've measured in Florida Bay throughout its history of, of sampling. Uh, chlorophyll A is the indicator that we use for algae in many of our waterways. So uh, we, we knew there was a problem. Uh, and looking back to previous seagrass dial in Florida Bay, this is something that didn't take place for a couple of years uh, after the late 80s seagrass dial. In 2015, we saw the dial. In 2016, we saw the beginnings of an algal bloom. And this is something that we need to be concerned about because it could flare up again and again. Now, um, for those of you that are on the water, this is something you might see, turbid water conditions. This, this is the indicator when you're out in, in your boat, you're not able to sight fish, you're not able to see the, the, the seagrass flats, even if the water is two to three feet in depth. So uh, this is what it looks like on the ground. This is what it looks like from space. Uh, we had satellites, MODIS satellites, that were actually able to capture the algal bloom as it developed and as it passed through the Florida Keys. Here uh, you can see in October 2016 there was a plume of green water passing just to the south of Long Key. You can see Isla Mirada there, uh, Lower Matacumbi, Upper Matacumbi. Uh, in December of 2016 with the changing winds we saw that plume getting carried as far down the Keys as uh, um, uh, Duck Key and even past uh, Bahia Honda, if you're familiar with uh, Bahia Honda State Park. So this is more than just uh, a localized seagrass dial algal bloom in Florida Bay. This is, this is a Keys-wide issue that, that we experience. Now we are seeing signs of recovery in Florida Bay. Uh, seagrass is pretty resilient. In fact, we have uh, a number of species that are on these flats, and you're familiar with them, I'm sure, but the, the shoal grass is really the colonizing species that comes back into these areas once they're disturbed. And so some of these sites where we saw just a complete wipeout of the grass beds, we're seeing shoal grass coming back in, but in many areas it's quite sparse. And as you can see from this photo, there's a little bit of stubble there, but more than anything, there's a lot of exposed bay muds that are vulnerable to resuspension uh, with a with wind event and moving that, that nutrient load that came from all that dead grass back up into the water column where we could see a cycle of algae blooms moving forward. Now, we were actually on the verge of another crisis in Florida Bay. Many of you, um, if you were fishing in Florida Bay, you may have been aware of this. Um, this is actually a screen capture of my browser's homepage, and so every time I launch my browser, I get from the Corps of Engineers real-time information on operations in South Florida. So I can tell how water conditions are in the lake, I can tell how water is moving through South Florida, but the key here was that for much of the beginning of this year, we had zero water moving from the water conservation areas into Everglades National Park. Now what that means is there's essentially zero water coming from Everglades National Park into <coughs> Florida Bay. And so salinity conditions were creeping upward again at the beginning of this year. If not for the rainfall events that we had in June, we may have seen another crisis. And, and what I want to point out here, and I, I know I probably <laughs> would be coached not to show data slides in this particular situation, but we were on the verge of another crisis. And what this points out is how reliant Florida Bay is today on rainfall events. If not for direct rainfall, we would have problems from year to year. Uh, we had two major rainfall events, one in early June, one in mid-June. And you can see what happened with salinity here in these particular cases. That dashed line uh, for both salinity and temperature is at 35. 35 salinity is the salinity of ocean water. 35 degrees C temperature is 95. So that's, that's bath water. Um, the thing to point out is we see these significant drops with those two rainfall events. We haven't had a significant amount of rainfall since so Florida Bay salinity is creeping back upwards of 40 plus parts per thousand, which again is hypersaline. We're in the early wet season. Hopefully this will continue to decline, but this is what Southern Storage helps us with, is to make Florida Bay more drought resilient and providing for those freshwater flows. The other thing this shows, uh, just kind of as an aside, is that with freshwater flow and rain coming into the system, we see that that helps to buffer the highs in water temperature that we know combined with salinity affect the oxygen holding capacity of the water 
for the fish that we all value in this ecosystem. Well, again, in terms of making progress, we are. Uh, many of the projects that Secretary Valentin talked about are on this slide. We're, we're advancing Everglades restoration. The key, really, though, is building storage back into this system. Uh, and southern storage will help us to move water from the lake back to the south. The Central Everglades plan and Tamiami Trail bridging will provide the conveyance for that water to ensure that it gets all the way down to Florida Bay. And this is just a recent picture I took. I probably shouldn't have been shooting photos while driving, but <laughs> this is going down Tamiami Trail. You can see we are making progress on this next phase of bridging, and that will allow us to move substantially more water into Shark River Slough and ultimately into Florida Bay. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. So you can see that uh, if you have any questions, again, 24-7, Steve's available, and he's glad to help you. You're going to kill me for saying that. You're just going to get a lot of calls. Our next speaker, I'm delighted to have. He's partially responsible, partially for my love of fishing, and particularly fly fishing. In 2000, I moved to Texas with my family to windsurf and fell in love with fly fishing in the lower Laguna Madre. And of course, in the lower Laguna Madre, which has an average depth of about eight inches on a good day, skiffs work very well. And the first skiff that I was able to purchase was a Maverick skiff and it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> it's a great boat, and I had many a great journey with it, and when I moved to uh, Florida, I upgraded, and I'm about ready to upgrade again, which Scott said, good, glad to hear that. One of the things that happened in 1984 is Scott founded the company with his brother, Troy. So Maverick has a rich history in the fly fishing and fishing community with all the various boats that they developed. And they were devoted, and still are, fly tackle and fly anglers. And Troy still is involved in that to some extent. Fairly well. And they make a heck of a skiff, as you know, and do a great job on boats. Even from the earliest days, the crew at Maverick has been involved in giving back to the waters that we all use. They fueled our passion and provided us with inspiration by making great boats. And most importantly, Scott himself, as the CEO, was given the Coastal Conservation Associate, Association Award and Lifetime Achievement for his involvement in successful conservation initiatives, like, for instance, the ban on nets and many others. So it's a pleasure to have a manufacturer with a rich history great boats to speak to us today about what Maverick is up to and some of his views on conservation. Scott? Well, thank you, Ed. Um, tough man to follow, but I'll do my best. I, I have a completely different uh, twist on the presentation for, this, for, uh, for you. I'm not here to talk about science issues. I'm, just, I'm a businessman. And I represent the marine industry in Florida and nationally. I'm involved in the National Marine Manufacturers Association. And I just have a few data points I'd like to share with you. Uh, page down. And again. Okay. You grabbed the wrong one. Uh oh. Okay. So, yes, we're a flash boat builder. Uh, we started in 1985, and, and between Maverick and Hughes, we've been the largest builder uh, of flats boats, which it's sort of the jumbo shrimp of markets uh, for 30 years, but it is something. Um, but the, the flash boat business in, is in decline, and I'm going to speak to that uh, in a little bit here. Um, this is a slide prepared by the National Marine Manufacturers Association about the marine industry's impact in Florida, approximately 10.3 billion. You can see it's huge. Um, not counting the other economic drivers, when you, when you look at the, the soft impacts, you're talking about uh, 1.3 million jobs, $109 million, uh, billion, dollars, all dependent upon you know, the environment. As the Secretary said, Florida is a, is, is a place where people come to do things, and water is first and foremost. Um, but the flash boat business uh, has declined approximately 80% 
according to Statistical Surveys, Inc. Uh, boats are titled assets, so we can track how many are being purchased new boats every year. And uh, from the peak, of, we used to build around 750 flat boats a year. Now we only build about 150, but we're still the largest builder. So that speaks volumes to what's happened across the state of Florida, particularly Florida Bay, and, and how it's impacted jobs already. Uh, now, flash boats represent only about 8% of our uh, boat sales revenue and uh, probably 6% of our overall revenue. So uh, why is that? What's happened? Well, I think resource degradation in the Indian River Lagoon on the east, the uh, St. Lucie Estuary in particular, uh, the Caloosahatchee as we know, they're all in crisis. Florida Bay and Everglades National Park is really where the flats boats were developed. And as you saw from the good doctor's presentation, why would someone buy a boat specifically made to go apply those waters when the waters are in that kind of shape? And what happens to the jobs of the people that make those products? They go away. So is there a demographic shift? Yes, some of it's in demographics, some of it's market changes, but I would argue that a very large percentage of it is, is the loss of what I would call abundant opportunity where you used to be able to go out, and I think uh, one of our later speakers should probably speak to this much better than I, and literally have an opportunity to see a thousand bonefish in a day. Now you hope to see one or two or ten on a good day. So um, to I'm not picking on anybody, but to compare and contrast the numbers, I talked about the 10 billion plus 10.3 billion the boating industry has and marine industry has in Florida. We contrast this to an agricultural business that has very, very large impact on our watersheds all over the state. Um, you know, an in, a 10% reduction in marine industry's impact would, would still be double the impact of uh, one of the large contributors to some of our problems. Not picking on them, we need to find a solution that works for them and for us, but it's just an interesting economic fact. And, if, if administrations and politicians are about jobs, as they all would like to say they are, then they need to look seriously at this, and I think they are. I think we have their attention, finally. I don't think that's been the case for quite a few years. And one of the contributions I was able to make to that discussion was to, to draw together a letter that brought in what I refer to as, as more heavy iron in terms of industry. Uh, it's you know part that makes up that $10.3 billion. Companies like uh, Brunswick Corporation, Yamaha Corporation, and of course our companies, and, and many, many of the other, uh, maybe smaller, but just as important companies, and say, hey, this is a jobs issue. This is, this is jobs, jobs, jobs. And if we don't get the ship righted, people are going to be losing their livelihoods and they're going to be pissed. So um, that was my contribution. That's the extent of my presentation. And I'm going to turn it over to our next speaker, who's going to be Ed. Right? Thank you. Now this may have a very slight resemblance to Flip Pallet, but it's not. It's actually Jason, and Flip is with us this, e this afternoon. Uh, we've heard from Noah in terms of policy and government issues and all the things that have to happen to make change lasting and viable in the state of Florida and elsewhere. We've heard from Steve, the science, the ecology, and what needs to be done and what continue needs to be done throughout Florida, as well as Florida Bay. And with Scott from a business perspective, as well as a heartfelt passion for the fishing community, what needs to be done from a business perspective. And now I'm pleased to introduce someone who really doesn't need much of an introduction, Flip Talent. In the entertainment world, uh, Flip has certainly provided tons of that over the these 25 seasons of the various shows I watched. Chris and I were talking before this meeting, we were going over episodes. We don't act them out, but we kind of do some of that stuff. We're roommates, Chris and I, so it gets odd anyway. But it's also important to know one thing about Flip that I have a personal story about. You may recall this. About eight years ago, when I lived in Texas, when I got my first Maverick, uh, we invited Flip down to the Laguna Madre Fly Fishing Association to be our banquet speaker. And in his wonderful fashion, he showed up with a carousel of slides, 
And we thought, uh oh, we got to get a projector. We got to get kind of get fired up for this because we have PowerPoint and all this stuff. And so Flip was gracious. Everybody loved him. He get a, the slides were beautiful. Once in a while, he yell at him because they'd stick. You know, it's a good presentation, the good stuff. But this, what I really want to share with you is that many people see Flip as a legend, as an entertainer, as a a variety of things, but in my world, I see him as an educator. His TV shows, his demeanor, his uh, humble presence that we see all the time in the fishing community. And a quick story, he inspired a bunch of old guys in Texas, and I don't think he knows this. We, the next day after the banquet, uh, Flip was nice enough to stay with us. We met in a conference room. And he went over knots and fishing techniques and fishing in the lower Laguna Madre and gave us a boatload of information. A bunch of us sitting around upstairs going through that. And then in the afternoon after lunch, we broke out for casting with Flip. Now, we were, there was probably about 20 of us in Flip. And there was 20 flailers out there in Flip Palette. And he was just walked around to each of us flailing away, especially me, because I find when something gets tough, just do it harder. And he leaned up to me and he said, Ed, less is more. And you, that one you probably don't remember, but something along those lines. And then we had the pleasure, finally talked him into, wow, this came apart, Chris. Uh, we had the pleasure of asking uh, Flip if he would please do some demonstration, because he was having us do all of the work, of course, and helping us. So Flip went to the side. I think at that time you had a line called the George Teeny or yeah. the Teeny line. And it was a fluorescent orange. You could see it from a half mile away. And Flip got to the side where we had trees behind him. And he was talking about casting and about less is more. And he was launching perfect, like a slinky, circles. And I realized, wow. What he's doing, what we're doing, is very, very different. But I am pleased to say, eight years later, some of us, including me, really got into fly casting. And one of the inspirational pieces from Flip Pallet is the image of him standing on the side of a field in South Texas, casting his Flip Pallet line, that orange fluorescent line, going back and forth. And every once in a while, we get to do that, and it's just a pleasure to have you. So come on up, Flip, and have a few words. Let's go. Thank you. Now, I was hoping to have a nice introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, no PowerPoint for me uh, this morning. I apologize for that. I got a lot out of the previous two PowerPoints, especially, Scott, some of that information is unbelievable. I mean, the numbers really speak volumes. I think that should mean uh, a lot to all of us. Um, I'm here uh, for a couple of reasons. I'm, I, I have a close affiliation with the Captains for Clean Water. Uh, many of you may recognize them as a uh, a grassroots group uh, started by a couple of captains over on the west coast of Florida who were concerned with the very water issues that you've just been hearing about. And they took it upon themselves to turn this little grassroots organization into what has become sort of a cultural representation of all of us who have traditional Florida values, particularly as they regard uh, water and the water issues that we're also uh, critically concerned about. And my credentials for being here today speaking with you are much different than, than others who you've heard from. Uh, not nearly as impressive, uh, but they are basically um, that I have been a student of South Florida's wet spots for 75 years, and not a casual student. 
I've spent my entire life observing what happens to water in South Florida and in all of Florida because my experience is not just South Florida. So I, I hoped, uh, I'll be very, very brief, uh, but I did want to cover a couple of things with you. I, I think it's amazing that we've finally gotten some legislation that looks like, if we keep after it, that we will have some storage for water that we can use in Florida Bay at some point and in the Florida Keys and beyond, out to the reefs that lie offshore of the Keys. All of them depend on this sweet water that we're trying to save and administer as it's needed uh, through the year. So I have, I have this overriding concern at a personal level that what we do with this water that we're going to save is critically important, as we all know and agree. But I'm concerned on an ongoing level because I've seen so much of the past, I think I can see somewhat into the future, and it looks like this to me. The water that we save in these water conservation areas, or whatever we're going to call them, uh, is important. And what we do with it is equally important, but I think that in the long run, and in the final analysis, what will be the critical factor will be the quality of the water that goes into those areas. And I understand that those areas are supposed to provide filtration and settlement and so forth, and I know that they will to some degree, but the aquifer that underlies that water is like a giant sponge. And that same aquifer continues down <coughs> through Florida from about here all the way to Florida Bay. It underlies Florida Bay and the Keys. <coughs> and the offshore reefs are all part of the aquifer. It doesn't just end at the end of the road. So ultimately, as all of the chemicals and nutrients that are delivered to these conservation areas or settlement areas with this water that we're going to ultimately direct south, at some point, this aquifer, which is just a giant sponge, will absorb, in my opinion, a large amount of these chemicals. And that's its purpose. But what happens when that sponge becomes full and can no longer absorb the poisons that we're putting into it? They will become carried to Florida Bay and to the reefs and everything south of these areas as the peninsula tilts to the south. So at some point, we have to be concerned. And it may not be now. We've just had a wonderful victory. But looking into the future, we have to be concerned about what we put in to those areas. I don't know how many of you <coughs> are Floridians, even in this group, or how many of you uh, are in the outdoors significantly. But I am. And every single day of my outdoor life, which is almost every day of my life, I see the introduction <coughs> of herbicides into every roadside ditch in the state of Florida, every borrow pit. You're all familiar with borrow pit? Borrow ditches. It's where our roads come from. They dig a ditch and pile the spoil up and that becomes a road and all those ditches are treated with herbicides. Every river marsh in the state of Florida is treated almost on a daily basis with herbicides. Every lake in the state of Florida treated every day with herbicides. <coughs> To build a building in the state of Florida today, you have to build um, a water retention pond. Every one of those water retention ponds is treated with herbicides to kill what the state of Florida has determined, rightly so, are invasive aquatic species. And those species include things like hydrilla, 
spatter dock, water hyacinth, duckweed. I don't know, there are many. Um, and they are problematic. But they're treated every day with a derivative of Roundup produced by Monsanto. And we don't really know uh, what the long-term effects of these products are. In Europe, there's science that says that they're horribly deadly to humans, but we have no idea what their effect is on larval stages, on amphibians, on crustaceans, on fishes, or on humans. But they kill all these invasive aquatic species. And they, as you said earlier about the masses of dying grass in Florida Bay, they die off, they go into suspension, they block photosynthesis. I'm not a science guy, but I see this every day. I see what happens to, I spend a lot of time on the St. John's River. Anyone familiar with that river? Just me. Um, the river has pretty much died. There are no invasive aquatic species on the St. John's River because it's treated every day. There's a fleet of airboats, which goes around every day, spraying Roundup on these invasive species. But they don't just kill those invasive species. The grasses that were in the St. John's River when I was a boy are no longer there. They're gone along with the invasive species. So to fund this constant spraying of the whole state of Florida, and we actually have huge tanker trucks with helipads on top of them, and helicopters land on these trucks, suck this poison up out of giant tanks, and then go spray it on our water. Water that we ultimately drink, water that ultimately winds up in Florida Bay and in the Keys and all the offshore reefs. We pay as individual Florida residents for this to happen in our taxes. We pay for this. We pay to poison ourselves. So we have to find a way that these invasive species are a problem, but they're not as big a problem as the solution is. We cannot continue to put this stuff in our water at the rate that we are. And I have no scientific evidence to back this up. I just see this every day. And I'm there every day to see it. But for the most part, the people of Florida are unaware that this is happening. And so if you could somehow magically wrap your mind around the number that must represent, from a business standpoint, the purchase of these chemicals by the state of Florida and by municipalities within the state of Florida or golf courses or clubs or whatever, wherever it comes from, if you could imagine what that number represents to the companies that produce these chemicals, it's got to be trillions of dollars or billions of dollars. So it's going to be hard legislatively because you understand the power that these companies have or that companies like the larger agri-interests or sugar interests of the states, which, as Scott pointed out, uh, have provided so little, but are responsible for the major part of the problem. Legislatively, we're going to have a terrible time dealing with this problem of poisons, which I think will be our biggest problem in the future, because now there seems to be an awareness that we need to start marshalling this water in responsible ways. But it has to be good water to have a good effect. So that brings me to the uh, notes. I don't know what happened. Uh, <laughs> the second thing that I wanted to mention to you uh, is something that I know uh, Scott and Jason will, will remember vividly. And the word that I want to throw out there for all of you to struggle with is referendum. There is a process called referendum where the people get to speak on important issues in the state of Florida. We get to put those issues on the ballot and we get to vote on them 
as the taxpayers in the state of Florida and as voters in the state of Florida. And to get an issue placed on the ballot requires a certain number of signatures. And I'm out of touch with the process. If anybody knows, please stop me or interrupt. But when, for example, we, we decided that netting was not beneficial to the resources of the state of Florida commercial netting, through the referendum process, we were able to stop commercial netting in the state of Florida. It involved the collection of a huge number of signatures, and this was back, well, I guess at this point it's been 35 years ago, something like that, that we did this? Not that long. But it was certainly before the advent of social media. The collection of these signatures was brutal. It was a door-to-door -door process. But public awareness was finally garnered, and enough signatures were garnered, and the issue came to the ballot, and we were able to ban commercial netting in the state of Florida. We could cause a similar thing to happen with these chemicals that are used to eliminate these invasive aquatic species. We could bring this question to a referendum. I don't think legislatively we'll ever see it solved. But the getting of the signatures today with the advent of social media would be a breeze. And the issue would be much simpler than that of the commercial netting issue. Do we want to continue to poison ourselves and our water at our expense or not? It's basically a yes or no vote. So through social media, we could raise the public awareness of this problem. Through social media, we could collect the signatures, the petition that we would need to put a referendum on the ballot. And if we could get organizations like IGFA and CCA and Bonefish Tarpon Trust and the Everglades Coalition and Captains for Clean Water and Bull Sugar and all of the other concerned, excuse me if I left someone out, we could solve this problem that has not yet truly raised its head but will. And that is the elimination, excuse me, of these aquatic species. I remember when I was a kid, we had the problems then. And they harvested invasive aquatic species. They actually had machines and people who harvested it, made mulch out of it, made fertilizer out of it. Prisoners were used to do it quite frequently when I was a kid. You'd see them along the roadsides in the ditches harvesting hydrilla and spatter dock and water hyacinth. So my whole purpose of being here this afternoon is to celebrate the work that all of these organizations have done to try to raise some awareness of what I believe will be a huge problem for us in the future and to provide an idea, or at least the beginnings of an idea, of how we might begin to deal with it. So I appreciate your time and putting up with my unscientific rambling. Thank you. Well, you've been looking at this photograph of Jason and his redfish for quite some time. I'd like to read from uh, the bio that Jason has as the conservation director of the International Game Fish Association. And I think it serves to be a great introduction for him. He is the conservation director of IGFA. And this actually, this position allows him to marry his background in biology with his love of fishing. Jason oversees the IGFA conservation programs as well as its world record program. When not chained to his desk, I hope he's not changed, he's a passionate angler and has fished extensively throughout the United States, Caribbean, Central and South America, and of course the Pacific. 
He's truly an angler who enjoys catching anything from bluegill to blue marlin. But he especially enjoys shallow water sight fishing. And I'm pleased to say I almost have him talked into going with me. And that's going to be a lot of fun. But Jason, it's all yours. It's good to have you. Thanks for having me, and I do apologize for the picture being up there so long. Um, it's dreadful to look at my face for that amount of time, but it was meant to make a point. A couple points, actually. You know. Ed's already brought up one. I'm a biologist by training, but I've, I've been an angler all my life. And um, Florida Bay is a place that's uh, really special to me, and it's a place that I've really gotten to be intimate, intimate with Excuse me, over the last two decades or so. It started with my graduate research in the uh, mid-90s, and then for the last 15 years or so, I've been fishing Flamingo in Florida Bay almost weekly when uh, working Mother will let me. Um, this picture was taken three years ago. Clear water, abundant turtle grass, and very healthy redfish. Uh, I visited the, this exact same spot a year ago, and it bears zero uh, resemblance to this picture. All that turtle grass is gone. It's not thinned out. It doesn't look poor. It's gone. And so are the fish. So IGFA's involvement in this issue, and my involvement, really is kind of a personal and professional matter. And what I want to talk a little bit about today is how recreational anglers are getting together and working with other groups to address this problem and help move the ball forward to, to fix the issues in some of Florida's major issues. Um, Stephen already alluded to some of this, but you know we've had water issues for a while. I mean. I've heard Mike Connor for years complain about periodic discharges from Lake uh, Okeechobee to the St. Lucie Estuary. We had a seagrass die up in, in Florida Bay in the, in the late 80s. Um, so we've had these type of disturbances before, but we're, we've been really slow to fix it. But then in 2015, we really had this perfect storm where we had calamities in three major estuaries all at the same time. You had you had uh, alpha blooms in the St. Lucie estuary, you had bad water coming out of Clusahatchee, and of course the seagrass died off in Florida Bay. So this really brought attention to the plumbing issues that we face in this state. So th the problem and, and the effects of the problem are readily identifi <coughs> identifiable by the general public in English. You can go to an estuary and say, wow, the water looks really cloudy here, what is this? An alpha bloom work. Well, there's a lot of dead fish. There's a fish kill here, or seagrass. Killing. The problem's easy to see. What's hard for the general public to grasp is what's causing that, and more importantly, what are the solutions? And I think early on, there was a lot of misinformation flowing around, especially through the internet and social media and things like that. You know, is it too much water? Is it too little water? Is it polluted water? Things like that. And of course, the, the real answer varies by estuary. But on top of that, the big fix for this, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, um, which was authorized a decade ago, um, it's complex. It's not one pro uh, program. It's a dynamic mosaic of 68 independent projects. And this is really hard for the layperson to get their head around. So it's not just one little thing that we're trying to do to fix the Everglades. So what a group of us started doing last year, and several of us are represented here, Captains for Clean Water, Scott Beal from Maverick Boat Works, we assembled something called the Now and Everglades Coalition. And what this served to do was to amass people where they could get information on what was going on with the state of our estuaries, the plumbing issues from Lake Okeechobee and things like that. And it also allowed us to document people that cared about this issue. We went on and signed a declaration that voiced their support. And we rallied people around one component of the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. Getting that land south of Lake Okeechobee, getting that storage so that we could move water down to Florida Bay. This is just one component. It's not the magic or silver bullet for everything, but it's been prioritized as one of the more important projects of the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. And it's something that people can understand. And more importantly, this one particular project can benefit all three estuaries. If you draw down the Lake Okeechobee, you don't need to have as much water discharge to the east and west. And more importantly, you get that water uh, <coughs> going south of Florida Bay. 
Uh, since we started this, we've had over 62,000 people sign the declaration, and it's working. It's getting people involved. It, it provides a way for people to be called into action to do things. Uh, we had the Now or Never Glade Sport Fishing Day in Tallahassee on April 11th. Hundreds of people turned out to voice their concern over how water is being managed in the state and the effect on marine habitats and fisheries. Um, came out to talk about the support of Senate Bill 10, which ultimately passed. So we think it's working in terms of getting people together, disseminating that information, and then providing a tool that we can kind of enumerate people that are concerned about this. Excuse me. Yeah, missing the slide. Yeah, missing the slide. But. So where we are now, we have Senate Bill passed. Senate Bill 10 passed. This is great. Now we have approximately, what, 800 million for um, purchasing land for the reservoir, but that's only half the component. Now we have to transition into a federal uh, initiative, and it's going to be more important than ever uh, for recreational language to stay involved in this issue. We're going to have to leverage what we were doing in the state, now at the federal level. Um, Florida is big, recreational fishing is big in Florida. Um, it's over $7 billion. Recreational fishing is also big nationally, and Florida sits on the very top of the heap for it. We have more recreational anglers in Florida than any other state. We contribute more uh, economically, so we need to leverage that. And I'll just close out by saying that, you know, if you haven't done so already, visit the Now or Never Glades website, look at the Glades Declaration, sign it. And again, that allows us to document the number of people that are concerned about this. And when we go meet with policymakers and things like that, we're able to say that thousands upon thousands of concerned businesses, recreational anglers, and other people want this issue fixed. Um, and it also provides a way for you to get information about what's going on, updates about how things are progressing with surf, um, anything related to Everglades water management. Um, it's disseminated in newsletters. So that's the end of my presentation. Thanks so much for having me today. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> this becomes the fun part of the presentation along with the informative part. And that's for all of you. So I'd like to open it up to Q&A. I have a bunch of questions I could ask, but you're going to do a lot better job than me. You can address anyone on the panel individually, or you can ask the panel as a whole. So I'll start with... I have a question for Scott on one of your uh, slides regarding, uh, I think it was a picture of the sugar cane field, and he has some figures up there regarding the, the economic contribution of agriculture. Yes. Were, you just, were those numbers relating to sugar cane? And, uh, they were, it, <coughs> first of all, I invite you to fact check my research because I am not a scientist, but. Well, guess what I already did, and. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, let me respond to your okay, question. Okay. Thank you. The uh, slide came from a report, I believe, uh, University of Florida 2009 or 2009, can't remember which, that I found uh, doing some research, and, and it's entitled, the, it's an agriculture report on all the different industries, including sugar, and that was uh, their figure, uh, and I can, I can provide that report to you, I don't have it with me, their figure on the economic impact. If that report is incorrect, um, I invite you to correct me and the uh, professor from the University of Florida who compiled the research. I'm looking at the University of Florida IFAS uh, website, and that's why I thought maybe your numbers just pertain to sugar, because in 2013, agriculture... No, it wasn't agriculture, just sugar. Sugar and sugar processing. Okay, but I think it's not necessarily fair to just target one agricultural industry because when you were speaking you said agriculture not specifically sugar because agriculture added over 150 billion dollars to Florida's economy in 2013. So you know if you want to say sugar and show a picture of sugar I mean that's fine but to say agriculture in general I think is a little bit Okay, well, if, I'm, if that's how I characterize it, that was not my intent. I think, as you recall, I said, I'm, I'm not picking on these guys. We need solutions that work for them as well. But I think we need to recognize that, that you know, the economy of Florida is very important. Agriculture is a huge part of this Florida economy, and I understand that. But we've got to come up with solutions that work for, for everything without destroying the environment that people come to Florida. That's why the southern solution makes so much sense to 
to, to me as a, as a layperson and, and a user of the environment, and to the scientists to, to my left and to my right. I, I, I just say that because I just think it's so important that <coughs> the entire picture, when you're asking the public to buy in to a solution for a problem that's everyone's in Florida, and to your point about the, the chemicals, certainly I don't know what part that plays in the, the quality of our water, but I would have to think that things like runoff from pavement, parking lots, um, you treated your yard, um, whatever it is, you know, we all have our own contributions to uh, that type of pollution or poisoning. And again, I think it's something that we have to address as a big picture, not just this is state of Florida poisoning our waterways. Thank you for the question and the comments. It's an important one to bring up. Let's open it up for other questions. Please, in the back. Um, Jason, the question is for you. You compared your observations at Flamingo uh, about the habitat and, and fish uh, going, being gone. What are your observations about fishing participation uh, at Flamingo and assuming that it did decline? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm assuming that. Did those fishermen go someplace else, do you think, or did they just not fish? What, what impact do you think it had? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll put some perspective on it. Um, this is prime time of year for fishing redfish and stuff on the flats in Flamingo. Hot, still days, you'd have tailing fish all over the place, used to anyways. And there'd be a lot of boats. Um, there was plenty of places to fish, so it wasn't too bad, but uh, you can see a lot of people out there. Last time I was out front in Florida Bay was two weeks ago, and it was graveyard dead. There was hardly anybody in Florida Bay. So they're moving to different areas. I, mean, I have friends that are fishing Chukalusky, or they're fishing Biscayne Bay more, or they're fishing the Keys, but um, you're not seeing nearly anybody, or nearly the people that are fishing in Florida Bay. Thank you. Other questions? Whip. Yeah, Steve or me, Noah, best case scenario, when is that reservoir built and actually moving water south? So I'll tell you, I mean, so the legislation had a clear direction that the water management district, and this is one of those things in legislative process is amazing, it's already started. You know, we're in July, that's essentially when new budget year begins and you, you start thinking mm -hmm. about moving forward. So you've already had their website up, they've got a report due to the legislature. The area they're working on right now is you know, generally um, stakeholders have pointed out an area next day one where you could look at that reservoir. Mm -hmm. um, and the first step was um, sending letters out to landowners, gauging interest, starting negotiation, and working with the core, our federal partners, um, and gathering that information um, and getting a report back to the legislature. They've got an early session this year, so it would be in January. Um, and so all that happening in, in real time as we speak has been kicked off. So I'd say the first step is getting to January, doing that initial process, mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then tracking forward. Thank you. And then I'll just add that on top of that, there's a process of project planning, and there's a significant amount of uh, stakeholder input, public participation, uh, modeling, development of alternatives that are really refinements based on what the, the final footprint is. Um, and then moving forward, you obviously have construction, uh, some kind of phased implementation. So you're looking at several years down the road to the point where you're finally getting all of the benefits that you, that you envisioned from the start. But, you know, it's just one of those things that if we were to keep delaying, then, then all of this frontage work that needs to be completed just gets pushed off in the future. So the idea is to have, uh, ideally, uh, projects like the, the bridging of Tamiami Trail, the, the important conveyance and water quality aspects of the Central Everglades plan that allow that water to flow south, sort of synced up such that when you have this uh, important storage component, then it's, you know, realizing all those benefits simultaneously from the estuaries all the way down to Florida Bay. Mm -hmm. Chris. Yeah, Steve, um, 
what are the opportunities on the federal level right now? Jason can probably answer some of these too to get some additional federal funding to match uh, what the state has, has been able to put forward. I think I read a stat from you guys that said something like uh, when the state has outspent the feds by about a billion dollars at this point on Everglades restoration. Where are the opportunities to get the additional federal money? Well, all I can say is that Everglades Restoration is a 50-50 partnership um, in the comprehensive plan between the state and the federal government. Um, there are some things, some stipulations that um, prevent, you know, uh, being on par with one another throughout the process of restoration. And, and some of those things are that the, the federal government can't get out ahead of the state in terms of expenditures. And also when there's land acquisition and things like that involved, the state is a responsible party. So that leads to that sort of imbalance, but I, I don't you know, know the policy side of it well enough to be able to say what is accounting for that, but it is a 50-50 partnership. Mm -hmm. Any other comments from the panel on that subject? Other questions? Please. So where we're at now, where, where should the fishing community and the media put their effort to uh, continue the effort? Where, where would be the best next focus um, for us to get together and work on? No, please do. <laughs> so, you know, I'd say one of the things in talking about the importance of partnerships, and certainly this community does, has done a really good job. You heard, you know, just the last few slides talking about getting a diverse group of folks together um, and sort of celebrating progress. And then, and then again, it's the sense of urgency. I'd say one is the diversity matters. It needs to be a joint effort, not just among user groups and recreational anglers and so on, but you gotta have agriculture, all the stakeholders um, who care about our environment working together. And I think taking that same, same approach y'all have had as far as building a diverse group of, of anglers and saying, hey, we're also farmers, we're also living in the area um, and, and building that stakeholder you know, group out will pay great dividends. I also think probably the most important slide for anyone, and I'm glad it was up for a while, is a redfish and a grin. It's the sort of, you know, why are we doing this? Why is it important to live in Florida? I mean, the same thing could be, um, you know, someone's family farm, you know, someone's favorite resource. It's, it's bringing that sense of urgency and connecting us all back to the reason we're all doing this. Um, and so, you know, not everyone has the privilege of being out on a farm, being out on the water every day, being able to, to realize and, and see that resource and have that sense of urgency. For those of us who are and have that ability, I think it's really incumbent on y'all um, to remind us of that and celebrate yeah. the progress as we go forward. So we don't celebrate that and we don't have that reminder of the sense of urgency. And again, I'd urge you it's a, a diverse one. Um, you know, we won't make the same progress. And let me kind of specify what, what would be the next restoration or funding kind of challenge to uh, help your all work go forward. Mm -hmm. I think urging continued. So the state, we're in a, I mean, again, I can't talk about under Governor Scott's leadership under the legislature, the, and it sounds so wonkish to talk about it. And so, you know, don't glaze over on me, but imagine sort of looking out in your financial portfolio for building your business or for, for, for anything. And you sort of say, I can't think further than a year out about my future, but I'm dealing with it you know, a 20 year problem. Mm -hmm. So the state's now moved to recurring funding, $200 million, we're even adding money on top of that. Mm -hmm. And so sort of that same sense of urgency and partnership with the federal government to say, you know, we need you just as committed as ever before, I think would help because we're gonna move into, you saw the progress we're making on coastal storage um, for CERT and we'll be moving into SET next. <coughs> and so having that sense of urgency there um, means a lot and hopefully the story you've got from the state's commitment helps a lot in, in landing that. I know I saw, I think the pamphlet's talking about legislative ask. I've seen yes. letters recently um, to Congress from some of the partner groups asking them for CERT funding, um, mm -hmm. SEP being part of that is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the audience? Anything else? Um, I'm, Brett, I'm I was hoping, I was just gonna call on you, you knew it. <laughs> It's an easy one. All right. uh, Scott, how, how, how far back do you have to go to me when you measured out that 80% decline in boat sales? That, that's from a peak of, um, has that been a five-year decline? 
Uh, now it's more like 12. Okay. 12 years, and it's if you want the information, I've got the statistical surveys going back probably 15 years. Okay. For the registered, different players come and go within the space within mm -hmm. that market, um, but if you look at at that, what at least what I consider is someone who's been in the flats business a long time, what, what a flats boat manufacturer is, not a canoe manufacturer that may be out on the flats, but purpose built boats, they're designed to be pulled for fishing in shallow waters. Right. You limit the, the thing to that. It's 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 a shadow of its former self. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions before we finish? Daniel. Yeah, I had a question uh, I guess for Scott, Cliff and, and Jason. I, I uh, I'm in my mid twenties, I've only been involved actively involved in this issue for a couple of years. Uh, you all <laughs> have been seeing the negative uh, impacts of this since before I was born. Uh, how do you feel now, you know, how confident are you in it, that this issue is going to get fixed and, and what have you seen along the way? I, mean, I, I always wish I, I could have seen what Florida Bay was like 30, 40 years ago and I, you know, I, I can only rely on flip stories and the rest of your stories, but how confident are you now and, and what have you seen over the last 30 years that we're going to have a future for, for this industry? Um, what do you think we need to do to be to make yourself more confident that we can get this fixed? Well, I, I don't think I don't know if this is directly going to answer your question. The the problem we're facing here is that, say we get the funding on the federal side, if you don't flip the switch, and things are back to normal. It's going to take time to build things like the reservoir and some of these other projects, and then recovery of seagrass in Florida Bay can take a decade or decades if it comes back at all. So I'm concerned, I'm 45. Um, I'm concerned that I might not see Florida Bay like it was in my fishing lifetime. Um, but this is something we have to do. Um, it's unconscionable, in my opinion, that we've, we've gotten to where we are, particularly with Florida Bay. We saw this happen in the late 80s. We know why it happened, but we really didn't do anything to fix it. We got to work hard and keep pushing uh, to fix this or it will get worse. Mm -hmm. Other comments from panel members, please. I have fly lines that are older than he is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fly so do I. <laughs> and I still use. Yeah. Please. Well, I think one of, the, one of the dangers, Daniel, is that, and I hear this a lot, and I'm sure we all hear this a lot, People hear stories about how Florida Bay was or how Florida was 30 years ago, 40, 50, 60 years ago, how wonderful it was. Sadly, as Jason said, we didn't fix it. Um, and people today, I hear this when I go to talk with groups and clubs and so forth, and there's this, this thing I hear, well, we love hearing those old stories, but these are the good old days. These are not the good old days. These are horrible days, and we have to do now what we should have done 30 or 40 years ago, and it's beginning. That's very heartening. But uh, this, this feeling of, oh, well, these are the good old days. This is what we have. We should enjoy it. Bad. Mm -hmm. Any other comments from panel members? I'll just add that, you know, it, it's... If we go back in time and, and think about the history of drainage of the Everglades and moving water away from Lake Okeechobee, it, it's really taken us more than a century to get to this point. It, it yeah. takes time to build these, these massive infrastructure projects that move billions of gallons of water and, and you know, just echoing the points we need to take action now that we are is, is very heartening. Uh, on the other side, we know these projects cost money but at the same time, we know the economic benefits of getting the water right in South Florida. And I think the entire fishing community recognizes the value of getting the water right in this ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've noticed, I've been involved with this issue for less than two years. A lot of fishing guides, a lot of businesses have gotten engaged on this for the first time. That's what gives me hope. And I quit my job to get involved with this issue. And a lot of other people have jumped in the water too, and that, that's what gives me hope that this is going to get fixed now. You know, we're we're, we're on the right track, and you know, I 
I certainly hope that, that others who've been involved with this for longer than I have can see that, that same pattern. And, you know, hopefully we can, you know, form the next generation to where when they're growing up, their main concern is, is making sure that that, that estuary is protected. Mm -hmm. One more question, please. Yes, um, I, I would just like to underscore that the effort doesn't have to come from the federal level. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious that no one here has talked about the grassroots efforts that are ongoing now from everyday citizens to help rebuild reef, plant sponge, take care of seagrass, sample water, catch and release fishing yep. is a new ethic that has been certainly promoted. And I wonder if any of you can speak to the fact that there are things that are happening now with this generation, you know, young and old, that do signal a new day. I know every state agency offers the chance for citizens to participate in restoration projects. But, and I'm sure every one of you as well, all of your associations. But I think that should be a huge focus. Yes. Because we are 20 million right. residents and 100 million visitors. And that can make a big difference. Absolutely. I'm glad that that's kind of the segue what I was going to mention. That as we finish up today, I hope that many of you will stay for our roundtable discussion when we talk about and have an opportunity to have dialogue as well as presentations. We won't be presenting at 1.30, we'll have dialogue. And I do want to point out that all of the panel members here that I've gotten to know, some for the first time over the last couple hours and some I've known for a while, it is a grassroots effort. And the grassroots effort began for me when I came into this position when I walked the halls with Tallahassee and Don holding my hand so I wouldn't get lost. And in our group, we had 12 people, and we visited uh, 10 offices in Tallahassee. The age range in our group was eight years old to me at 70. That's a pretty good spread. And who stole the day were the two kids we had, eight and 11. Because the legislature's really listened to them and the point I wanted to make as we finish up with all of you here, it is a grassroots effort, effort, it's a diversity effort, and I'm really pleased to say that in Florida in the year I've been involved, I've seen more and more of that all the time. So thank you all for being here, and please give our panel a round of applause.